Today, we are looking at the Gestalt theory. So to begin with, we will give a quick overview of the history of the theory. Then we will move into the major components that make up that theory. And finally, we will end with the way of thinking, being, and doing as a Gestalt therapist. So when you're ready, go ahead and move on to the next slide. So to begin, I want you to simply to read these couple of comics. And based on the reading that you had already, I just want you to think um, through the Gestalt lens of what these comics are really saying and what they mean. Kind of jot down just a couple of words that come to mind and how they might fit into your understanding at this point of the Gestalt theory. And then at the end of the PowerPoint, we'll actually come back to this comic and see if anything has changed. So go ahead and just take a couple of minutes and write down a few words that come to mind before you move on to the next slide. A real quick intro to the Gestalt theory is something that it was developed by Frederick or Fritz Perls in the 1940s and 50s. And it was really through his work um, with soldiers that had brain damage, he got him to see the importance of looking at humans as a whole rather than just their parts. Um, and a lot of his focus really became about that awareness piece, helping people become much more aware of what's happening to them. Later, then, his wife, Laura, helped him contribute further to the theory, and she really incorporated her use of music and dance um, to really focus on support and contact. Uh, and she was able to really draw an awareness about people's being through the music and dance. Um, much of the focus on Gestalt theory is on the relationship and helping people really focus on the present experience of things rather than looking at the why. Uh, it's much more about the process that happens rather than the content of what they're saying. Um, and so this means people are really looking at what's happening rather than why things are happening. And they really believe that the experience is much more important uh, than the words or thoughts that are put behind it. There are two key components that really make up Gestalt theory. The first is phenomenological and the second is existential philosophy. When you hear the word phenomenology, what that really means is that lived experience. It's that essence that a person has through their living. So in Gestalt theory, people construct or they interpret their reality based on the experiences they have around them. Um, and so this means that people give some sort of significance to the interactions they have with people and the things that they encounter in their lives. The important piece to remember here is that it's about that interaction. It's about that lived experience. It's not so much about the thoughts tied with it. It's not so much about the reasons why behind it. It's so much. It's all focused on that interaction and the experience of that. Another piece, the second piece then, is the existential philosophy. Uh, and this happens as that construction and that interaction occurs with the environment. And then people are able to grow, develop, and gain some sort of sense of becoming. The book talked about people needing to deal with their problems on their own. This is done through that existential development, in which people gain that sense of becoming, or remaking, or rediscovering, and then they assign some sort of significance to it. Now let's talk about some of the key principles of Gestalt theory. As I stated earlier, Fritz Perls really believed in needing to address all of the parts of a person, and that we can't really break them into these separate pieces. It's all of these parts that are put together that are always influencing one another, and we need to address them at once in order for change to occur. This is known as holism. Some of the key pieces about holism is that there are some aspects of a person which are much more salient, prevalent, or pressing. These could be comprised of our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, our own body awareness, our memories, and even our dreams. Um, these items, as long as they're more salient, are known as the figure. Then there are some items which we are less, much less aware of. These are the items that are in our ground. These could be past events that have helped shape who we are as a person, yet we haven't taken the time to look that closely at them. The thing about holism is that it cannot be looked at alone. There is also the field theory, which is the context, situation, or environment that an indi individual is in. Both holism and field theory have an impact on the figure formation process and the organismic self-regulation. Both the process and regulation constantly interact with one another and cannot truly be separated, which is why I have them in the same box. In the figure formation process, the interactions a person has with the environment can influence what is brought to the front or the figure or a person. The organismic self-regulation works to restore any sort of equilibrium in a person if they are feeling off balance. So a, per a person who is experiencing a particular emotion that they are not feeling very comfortable with, the organismic self-regulation may kick in and try to restore that sense of peace and balance. Let's see if I can further help you understand this concept. Take a moment and think of a time when you walked into a room to get something, 
but as soon as you enter that uh, that room, you forgot what you were looking for. Now you're experiencing some sort of confusion, and you probably were trying to make sense of what was going on, and so you decided to go back to the initial room, and as soon as you did that, you were able to remember what you were looking for, and you felt much more comfortable. This is an example of how the environment and your interaction with it help influence what's in your figure and what's in the ground. You decided to go back into the same room because you had feelings of confusion and because you were feeling forgetful. And in order to get rid of those feelings, you had to go back to the initial room and consider the context in which you could remember things and bring back whatever was in that original figure. Now, I want you to try to practice a little bit further um, by looking at the images on the next couple of slides and quickly write down whatever image it is that you see. After looking at the two images, what do you see in them? Is there anything else that you happen to see, or maybe that you didn't see it at first? Think for a second and just write down how this might relate to holism, field theory, the figure formation process, and organismic self-regulation. We've already discussed some of the key concepts of Gestalt theory. However, I want to take just a few more minutes to take the time to talk about them a bit more in depth. First one is the importance of the now, being very present. Gestalt theory really focuses on the experience a person has. And so that means the focus has to be on the present in order to look at the experience. This is known as the phenomenological inquiry, really asking questions on what and how, and not so much the why. As a therapist, you can use the relationship and the experiences in the room to help raise that awareness, which can always change. Oftentimes, people are facing some sort of difficulty or challenges in their lives, which makes them feel out of balance. Um, and that is because there's some sort of unfinished business which is attempting to come from the ground into the figure. This also means a person is feeling stuck or unable to deal with the problems on their own, so the therapist can join the client in experiencing this impasse, challenge, or imbalance. However, it's important to remember as the therapist is that we're not there to rescue the client. Um, and we'll discuss a bit more about how to do this later with our clients. Another concept in Gestalt theory is the energy and the energy blockages that occur. Blocked energy is a way of protecting ourselves and keeping unfinished business at bay. It's an attempt to keep balance in our lives. However, if it, these things are not addressed or brought to the figure, we again can begin to feel off balance and create some sort of difficulty or challenge in our life. So it's a person's goal to become much more aware of where they focus their energy and work, in, work on opening up those energy blockages. Again, this comes to the experience um, that occurs for the client, which means being very present, which the therapist can help facilitate in the room. The last key concept of Gestalt theory is contact and resistance to contact. This is also re related closely to approaching things holistically. People use their senses to connect with the environment. Those who are in balance are able to engage in, in their surroundings without losing any sort of sense of their self. In order for this to happen, there must be awareness, full energy, and the ability to express oneself. And there are a few different methods in which people experience contact and resistance to contact. Those are introjection, projection, retroflexion, deflection, and confluence. I'm going to take the time to write down a definition for each one. Please don't copy this from the book, but write your own. And then talk about a time, or write about a time, when you've experienced each of those in your life. All right. Let's begin to put those concepts that we've just explored into practice. To do this, rather than discussing what I have on the PowerPoint slides, I want to try to actually offer a small case example and to start applying things so we can begin thinking about gestalt ways of thinking, being, and doing. So let's say an individual comes in expressing difficulties being able to establish and maintain meaningful relationships. You quickly learn that the client's past relationship ended because of infidelity by the client's partner. The client is shared that they feel that they are over these issues and that the client is very eager to have a new partner. You also learn that the client witnessed their father having an affair at the age of eight, uh, which ended up resulting in the parents divorcing when the client was 10 years old. As a Gestalt theorist, you may think that the individual needs to integrate these past experiences and find how they relate to what's going on currently and how they might be impeding the, client, impeding the client's ability to find and commit to a new relationship. You may have concerns that the client's past experience of witnessing infidelity 
something that they have not yet come to terms with. Perhaps it's something that's in the figure rather than in the ground, and that there is some sort of blockage there, making it difficult for the client to really be ready to move forward with relationships. As a counselor, you are thinking of finding ways to bring these past experiences into the ground, allowing the person to increase their own awareness and grow. In order for this to occur, you as a counselor must have a particular way of being in the room. An important part of counseling is the, pre the counselor's presence in the room. A Gestalt counselor works very collaboratively with their clients. This is done by establishing a strong rapport, trust, and willingness to push your clients. This means that you stay very focused on the present and help the client stay in the moment. You want to be attentive to what the client is doing and how they are doing it rather than what they're saying. So that means you focus, so, you focus less on what's being said but draw attention on the experience of what's happening in the room. This means the counselor must provide a space in the room in which the client can really begin living and feeling their experiences. So let's go back to our identified client. As a Gestalt counselor, we begin to help the client stay focused on the relationship topic uh, and what's happening in the present rather than focusing on the client and what they're saying about past relationships. Um, and remember, it's important to stay focused on how the client is saying things rather than what the client is saying. So perhaps the client will say, I'm over what's happened in the past and I'm ready for new relationships. However, you as the counselor, you begin to notice that there seems to be a bit of a negative tone and the counselor will then draw attention on that tone and the mannerisms that the client's using as they speak. An important part of a counselor's being is also the interventions that they are used. So let's move on to the next slide to learn more about Gestalt counselors doing the interventions that they'll use. The last piece I wanted to cover is the Gestalt way of doing things, the interventions that a counselor will use in the room. So, Gestalt, Gestalt counselors tend to take on a bit more of an active role in sessions, however, they do not come in with much of an agenda. Remember, Gestalt theory is all about the here and now. So that means interventions come up in the room and they focus very much on the experience the client is having. The interventions also get the client to, to really live those experiences out. So this means actually acting things out in session. Interventions may look like um, an empty chair, which is having the client actively talk to the person they are imagining and imagining that they are there in the room with them. Another might be rehearsing what they are going to share with others or even reversal, which is having the, the client consume the role of another person in their life to try to gain perspective. It's also important for the client to take ownership of the experience. So the counselor will get the client to shift from speaking in the third person, the first person, helping them take responsibility, ownership, and really draw attention to the client's experience rather than allowing them to keep the topic outside themselves. So what that means is you often you might hear a client be saying, you know, when you really do something like this, it really means that you're it's having an effect on you. So you might have the client shift and say, as this is happening to me, I really notice the effect that it's having on me. Okay? So let's go back to our case. Your client has shared that about two major incidents of infidelity, which have resulted in breakups and loss. The client begins talking about their past relationship and how much it has hurt them. You notice that the client is saying things like, you really get hurt when someone does something like that to you. An appropriate intervention here would be to, get, to take a shift uh, so that the client is speaking in the first person and maybe using an empty chair so the client can express their feelings. So you would get the client to say, I really get hurt when you cheated on me. It makes, makes it hard for me to trust others. This way the client begins experiencing what it is like to live through that type of conversation and is able to bring forward emotions connected to the experience, bringing, in, bringing the figure into the ground and integrating the different types of the client. Hopefully now you have a bit of an understanding of Gestalt theory and what it looks like. Uh, before we finish, let's go back to that Calvin and Hobbes cartoon on the next slide. After going over the theory and getting a little bit of exposure to what it looks like when it's applied, I want you to now take that information and apply it to this cartoon. Write down a bit of what you think is going on for Calvin, the little boy, uh, and what might be in his figure and what might be in his ground. What might you want to do to help integrate the different parts of himself? Be sure to bring your responses with you and we will discuss what you come up with in class. Thanks, and we'll see you tomorrow.